All right, guys, we're not doing the intro. Because you know what? We're 15 minutes late, and here we are, and I already messed up the intro, so it's fine. I am Julie Ramjeet. Welcome to Horse Center Live. We are back this week with um, a lovely guest. We have newly inducted Hall of Famer, jockey, or former jockey, should I say, Corey Nakatani. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, and my lovely co-host at Swiss Army, Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, Sean is super excited that you joined us. He sent me the text immediately when he when you confirmed that you would be on. So Sean, do you want to start tonight off by um, asking him some questions? Well, we, we'll do what we do with everybody else. Or, you know, it's your first time here, Corey. So how did you end up becoming a jockey? Oh, well, I was actually a really, uh, really good athlete. I just was uh, in wrestling. And I actually broke my nose in a, a tournament called Five Counties. And we went to the hospital, which was right there at the racetrack. So um, that was my introduction in uh, Santa Anita. And uh, I guess that uh, you can say it was little stepping stones. The first, you know, six to eight months, I, was, I went to a farm, learned how to groom horses at the World Jockey Association. And then I worked for Tony Matos at his farm when uh, Sunday Silence was a baby there. Um, and then uh, from starting at, you know, galloping horses at Galway Downs for the Hundleys, um, I just kind of snowballed. And, you know, I, I, was, I was remembering uh, when I first wanted to start riding, Aaron Grider was doing really good. He was like one of the leading riders. And uh, I wanted to wait until he was about ready to lose the bug when I, so I could start mine. So that, I just remember that. And you've had quite the journey. I mean, I like to always bring to light the amount of horses. Um, some of these riders have ridden when they come on, but I don't think I've seen a number quite this high. 23,740 career mounts. And that's just the ones listed on Equibase. Um, that's pretty incredible to ride that many horses in your life. Um, Yes, the wins are, of course, the you know thirty nine hundred wins, a little over uh, a little over that number. That is a, the the real celebration. But I think it's pretty amazing that you've tw almost twenty four hundred mounts. Talk about that. Talk about the horse. Was was there anybody specific well, that you still think about that you got to ride? Well, I, I think I, I think if you look at the how many I actually rode, and actually how many horses were in the money. I think it, it's pretty close to being, you know, 48% in the money, I believe. Yeah, top um, three, 45% career-wise. That's amazing. So, and, and, and only riding that amount, if you look at the people in front of me or the people that are ahead of me in wins and all that, I mean, they, they rode 50,000 mounts. Right. You know, I, I unfortunately got hurt. I got hurt a few times. Um, and the last one was a, a major major uh injury to where i broke my neck i fused they fused five vertebrae back in my neck to actually get me back to being able to move so uh thank god that i'm healthy enough to to be able to be put in the hall of fame uh but i, I always say that you know your family takes a back seat to your career and the hall of fame to me is is not only uh for your family um especially your wife my wife lisa and all the kids you know, starting with Brittany, Matt, Austin, um, Taylor, and Lila. Um, you know, they, they've been big supporters of mine the whole time. They've put up with me all these years. So um, when it's all said and done, there's a lot of horses that, that I rode that actually are in the Hall of Fame. Um, I believe the first one might have been uh, Serena Song. Um I believe she might have been the first one that went in. Uh, the mayor of the, the, I rode her at three, uh, two and three, and then Gary rode her in a few races after that. But um, I remember her, and it's all Greek to me. Uh, Lipta Justice, Elmhurst. I mean, all these horses that I was winning all these big grade one races on. Um, they all had a, a, a big input on my career where I was winning the big races. So then everybody just, you know, I was able to work with horses that might not have been the best horse, but at the end of the day, we were able to, to get the job done. Amazing. And, with, and with that, you had 10 Breeders' Cup wins. Talk about those. 
um, that was, uh, you know, uh, Let the Justice was one of them. Jewel Princess was another. Um, and then uh, I remember when I was riding Sweet Catamine uh, and she went the, the juvenile fillies, I thought, I thought we should have ran against the boys. I mean, she was that good of a filly. And um, at the end of the day, you know, every single one of the Breeders' Cups that I did win was very special. Uh, the last, the, the last one, last couple for Steve Asmussen. Um, you know what a what a career he's had as a as a trainer and and a Hall of Famer. So um, I've been very blessed to work with a lot of great people. Uh, Scott Blasey was one of the guys that I that I I admire as as a horseman and. Uh, he, he's Steve's top assistant, and um, there's just certain people that you click with, and Scott was one of those guys. So it just made my job a lot easier. So, is there what is the most thing, the thing you miss most now, sitting on the sides and not race riding? I know that's really hard for a lot of riders who do retire, even though they choose to retire, or maybe their body makes them. Um, what do you miss most about the sport? Everything, the horses. The people, the trainers. I mean, I, I truly, the racetrack is a family tip for me. You know, I, I truly love the horses and, and, and all the walks of the owners, a lot of the owners that I was very close with. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that I went out the way I did and getting hurt. But I think that, that the, the good Lord had a, another plan for me to, you know, start spending time with my, my youngest daughter, Lila, and she as you know, won a gold medal at 11 and she won the bronze the next year at 12 and we're going back. We're doing these trials now so she can go back as a, as a 13 year old to, to the young riders junior Olympics. So that is amazing. Wow. Clearly good genes run in the family when it comes to athleticism. So congratulations to the family on that. That's really exciting. So now you're kind of taking a step back and, your children are becoming the stars. That's got to be really exciting to watch. Yeah, it is. It actually really is. You know, um, start, you know, Matt. He's a, he's obviously he's an agent in, in the in California, and he's he's you know he, he rides all over too. You know, because he's got the Foley and he has uh, Mario Gutierrez, and um, he's making a name for himself in, in horse racing. And um, obviously, my daughter Lila, she's you know winning gold medal. Really as the first time she ever went and she led the team off in the thing and, and, uh, the, cause there's four riders in that. So all of my daughter, Taylor, she's a, she's a nurse. My other daughter, Brittany, she's, uh, doing horse therapy, uh, the acuscope and myoscope. And Austin, he does a lot of, a lot of different things, you know, from building homes to, uh, to shipping horses cause he loves the horses too. So uh, horses cool. are in our family and it's it just, I don't think you'll ever get it out of our blood. Oh, you can't get it out of the blood. Once it's in there, it's always in there. I know that myself. So I want to, before we get into the Hall of Fame induction, I recently binge watched, and I'm sure plenty of viewers have watched the show, the show they had on the Discovery Channel, Dockies, and you were featured on that. Talk a little bit about that experience. Um, You were kind of immediately introduced as kind of the rough and tough guy, Um. Tell us Somebody about had it. to be the bad guy. You know, you got to have good guys and bad guys. Sure. And I said, would you do it? And I said, sure. Why not? What the heck? So <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it, was, it was a little different, you know, because people are following you the, around the whole time. And I, I literally would get up at four in the morning and work out, lose weight, go to work horses, put on a sauna suit, run up the mountain, come back down and, and go ride, you know, five, six, seven horses. And then do the same thing the next day. So, right. you know, it was is very hard for them to base, basically follow me around because it was like, you know, you're always you're always working hard to, you know, not only working horses and talking to the trainers and stuff, but at the end of the day, it, it, it was a lot of it was a lot of fun doing it. It was super cool to watch. I totally wish that you would have they would have featured you a little more because the moments they did, it was super exciting. It was like, oh, what's going to happen next? And then they cut to somebody else. I was like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it's actually a lot of fun, but um, I think they wanted to do a spinoff in, in, on that show. But I think they were trying to to do something with the the jockeys and the wives and stuff. And, and I I just said, you know, I'm out. So um, it just it just is a lot of extras that you were doing and not, sure. uh, you know, 
being properly compensated for it. And it was, it takes up a lot of your time and you have cameras in your house everywhere and, you know, stuff like that. So, gotta be uh, well worth it for sure. but it was, it, it was a lot of fun doing it. It was fun to watch. And I'm sure uh, many people would agree. <laughs> yeah. So Julie brought up the hall of fame. Um, congrats on the hall of fame induction. And then also, why do you think it took so long? Well, I, I think there's a, a couple of things. Um, I think that uh, my my numbers and everything are obviously, you know what they are. They should have they should have put me in a long time ago. But at the end of the day, um, I'm in there now. I don't know the, the processes because they've changed, you know, uh, throughout the years. Um, but I but I know that there is a, a lot of the Hall of Famers that, you know, from McCarran, Lafitte, Mike Smith. Sandy Holly, um, you know, you just keep naming them. They're like, you know, Kent DeSormo and, and Alex Solis. They're like, you know, I should be in there already. But at the end of the day, I just, I, I, I let the process uh, work itself out and, and we're in there. So I was just, I'm very thankful that I'm, I'm alive and we're doing it. And my, my kids get to go and do it because in my eyes, I believe it's totally for your family. Absolutely. Uh, dishonor. So, because they they taken a the back seat for a long time, uh, obviously thirty some years of riding. So, um, and it wasn't you know, it wasn't the easiest because I was like I said I was always working horses, going to the gym, working out, losing weight, you know. Um, and it was for me it was a twenty four hour hour thing. It wasn't like I could just you know go out and have dinner and all those good things and you know it, it wasn't like a regular job for me it was just, i love doing it that's why it wasn't a job so i just i still love it i just unfortunately don't get to do it anymore. is there anybody that you love to watch do you watch the races is there anybody a jockey of yours that you really enjoy or root on now that you aren't riding with them well i was hoping when i was when i was riding flavian pratt came over and i was helping flavian in the corner and he was right next to me and I showed him how to read the racing form, uh, you know, basically do your homework and going into the races. So you have an idea what you want to do and where you want to be. So um, I, I'm, I enjoy watching them ride uh, the Ortiz brothers. They they're doing really good. And I rode a lot in New York too. And, and I'm very happy to see Javier Castellano win the Derby. I, I picked yeah. his horse. So um, <laughs> I actually, actually very happy that, that he was fortunate to, to get that Derby. Yes, very, very well deserved there. And you named some, you know, awesome names, you know, the Ortiz brothers, just, I mean, there's a lot of really good, exciting riders on the, every, on every circuit right now to watch. So, and you were one of them. So I was totally a fan excited when Sean told me you were coming on. So yes, it, I, I, you, you have a fan in us for sure. Still, even though you're not on the track, um, you have affected many. I mean, some of the horses you've ridden are horses. I grew up watching Serena's song, um, just a, lava man i mean just some really amazing animals um i swear they it's just it's it's a lot different now we have amazing animals but it was different back then the racing as a whole the feeling you know watching some yeah. of the guys run well that, well the whole thing is um I, I think that when you look at it um you know all of the hall of famers that were i was learning from and riding with and and fortunately i was actually winning riding titles and winning, uh, you know, a bunch of graded stakes races. And, um, I, I had a lot of mentors that I, that I was able to, to, to learn from every day in and day out, you know, and, um, unfortunately, you know, I, I believe the only two that are left in California is Kent and, and, uh, and Mike Smith that are still riding. Um, but if you, if you look at the, the, when I was riding there, it was Chris McCarron, Lafitte Pink Guy, uh, Eddie Delahousie, uh, Fernando Toro, uh, uh, DeSormo, myself, um, we just, there, there was a Gary Stevens. I mean, just keep on naming the guys that were very talented riders on, on, on horses. And mm -hmm. then, you know, not to mention riding with, you know, Pat Day and, and Jerry Bailey and, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Velasquez. I mean, um, when you look at it, there was a bunch of, a bunch of riders that, that I was fortunate enough to, to learn my craft from and and I was I was had a lot of fun doing it. And you were riding with some the, the best of the best. It, you know, my, my husband rides now and I, I always tell him, you know, 
it, the jockeys have to come together in the room of sense of when new riders come in and, and, and teaching them and helping each other and let, you know, learning from each other and finding a rider to look at above you that you can kind of watch and, you know, uh, add things to your craft that maybe um, inspires you. So you guys are the replays. Well, they watch some of these, you know, these younger guys, it's you, it's the names you named. It's, it's, it's Nakatani. It's Gary Stevens. It's Jerry Bailey. It's, you know, Garrett Gomez. It's, it's all those West yeah. coast guys. They, they, that's, yeah, you guys have some big well, items. So, so, so what? What you, the basically is what you would you would do, and and you can go back and watch replays on the way certain guys ride, you know. Um, but the whole thing is that you have to put in the work to get there. You know what I'm saying? So I would put in the work in the morning, uh, from working out to being ready to not get being tired on a horse, to being strong on a horse, to physically where I could actually help the horse. So that's, that's, that's part of it. Um, the, the, the real crucial point is communicating with the horses when you're working them, knowing what to do, how to get them ready and paying attention to when you're getting on horses for hall of famers. And, you know, like I was fortunate to get on horses for Johnny Longden, you know, uh, Charlie Whittingham, Laz Barrera, uh, the Stuckey brothers, you know, Wayne Lucas, uh, Bob Baffert, you know, you were able to take a little bit out of all these trainers. And then, you know, one of the guys I totally idolized was Bobby Franco and he could get a, a, a grass horse ready. So, so that that horse will be a champion that I was able to pick up all these little things from, you know, even Gary Jones. I mean, there's a bunch of people that I was able to work for, get on horses for, take a little bit out of what they'd all did with their training and, and kind of, put it into when I got on horses and I would, you know, hide the horse work in them and make sure the horse is ready. When I, when I said, Hey, look, we're ready to roll. Let's put them in a spot. And, uh, the horse would run and, and pretty much run through their conditions and, and run to where you, uh, were able to win the, the grade one races. And, and that was the whole key. It's amazing. Very, very, very smart. And you definitely have some very good knowledge. And that actually takes us into a really good question. Grandma Horse Racing is asking, how would you mentor or what advice would you give a young jockey? So I would say keep your eyes and ears open. I would say go out there and don't be bashful. Ask for help because they're, everybody's willing to give you help. Um, I, I, I kind of did it the opposite way. I, you know, I, I, when there, when you had so many hall of famers that I was riding, trying to, you know, compete against there, I was always told, no, you can't do it. So I, I had a chip on my shoulder to try to prove a point. See, so that's where, where I got my strength from is like, cause everybody's like, oh, you can't, you can't, you can't. And I was like, I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll show you. So that was my mentality. That's where I, I drew, you know, strength from. But, um, nowadays I think there's a lot more willingness for uh, trainers and riders and everybody else to help each other. So I, I think that when it's all said and done, you have to do the work, you have to put in the time and you have to learn. But at the end of the day, there's, there's a, a lot of people out there and a lot of trainers that will give you help. So Absolutely. don't be bashful. You ask and, and you ask riders, ask any, I mean, you could even ask me or ask any, any old rider that's retired. And they'll, they'll give you your honest opinion and, and try to help you. So keep your keep your eyes and ears open and don't be bashful and be gracious and thankful. And, and I think that will go a long ways. Awesome advice. Very, very, very well said. Yes, absolutely. Now, out of those jockeys, you've mentioned a lot of great jockeys. How, how much talking and stuff was there out there? How competitive did it really get between you guys? Well, I... I always talked out there, you know, I, 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 had fun. I was sitting in the starting gate and I was talking to Mikey and, and I said, Mikey, watch this one. And so I come out of the starting gate with no, with no reins, you know, I just threw the reins away and I said, Hey Mikey, come on, let's go. Let's see. You know? And we're sitting in the starting gate and we're breaking. Out. I just, I enjoyed riding. I had so much fun doing it. Um, and I was, I was, I had a God given talent. I was blessed. So um, I just, you know, I, in the races, I, you know, you're, you're not necessarily having a conversation, but you're sitting there saying, you know, if you're, if you're in a spot, say, Hey, I'm here, you know, letting them know where you're at. Cause if, you know, you don't want to, you know, have interference of your horse. So, um, 
but for the most part, you know, you're out there to, to win a race. You're out there to, you know, put your best foot forward and, and, and try to keep the horse, uh, concentration at a high peak and a high level and saving horse to be able to win the race. So, um, those are the things that you need to, to learn how you can relax the horse and get them to breathe and have them in the rhythm. So when you do ask them that you have more horse than the next person and saving ground is a big key and being in positions where you don't get in trouble, knowing who to follow, knowing which ones to follow, you know, to get you from point A to point B without getting in trouble. Cause if you're on a closer or you're on, you know, if you're on a speed horse, whether you're going to take the race to them or you're going to, you know, sit there and try to wait for the closer, the closer is going to out kick you. So you have to really pay attention and, and learn a craft and, and hopefully that uh, you don't take anything too hard because you you got to you got to learn. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn. So um, I was very fortunate to, to, to learn at a very quick pace. So um, and you had some I, really amazing courses like along the way, right? Yes. Oh, no doubt. You, so the whole thing is that the horses are, are have to get the job done. You have to do your work and getting the horse ready by working them, putting in the work helping the trainers know where the horses are, you know, like if a horse is drifting in there, the horse is drifting out, you know, there's stuff like that. You gotta, you, you know, gotta have a, a good rapport with the, the help and, and then whether it's assistant trainer you're talking to or the trainer you're talking to or the groom you're talking to, you know, you gotta have it on that, on that team of that horse, you're, you're doing everything in your power to make that horse its best. Right. So when you're paying attention and you're not just out there saying yes, 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 yes. Um, you know, you're, you're sitting there saying, hey, that you know, my the energy of the horse isn't quite there yet. You know, I'd say, you know, give a number to it. You know, he's about 75 percent. It feels like, you know, he feels like he's getting a little bit tired. You know, so those things are going to go a long ways with trainers once they realize and they trust you that you're giving them the right advice, and and to where the horses start getting better, performing better, winning. You know, from being second, third, you know, and then winning. So, um, I, I, I never, you know, there's trainers that ask me to ride horses. Roger Stein comes up to mind and he asked me to ride a horse and he goes, Hey, this horse is going to need a race. I said, Roger, I'm not your guy. I want to win for you. You put somebody else on it. I want to win for you. And I, I think he liked that about me because I said, look, if you've got one that you want me to work and you want to know where he's at, I'll get on it and I'll tell you if we're ready to win. If I feel he's ready to win, we'll go win races. Um, and that's, that's how I was with Roger. And then you have to build those rapports with, with trainers. So they know that when they call you and they ask you to ride a horse, you go, you talk to your agent and say, hey, I want to ride that horse for him. You know, he doesn't come to me with a horse that isn't ready. You right. know what I'm saying? And Very if you're not having the opportunity to get on them, I was fortunate to have an opportunity to get on a lot of horses. So um, that I love doing it. So that was a, a big a big plus for me. How much did that change over the years with the trainers? You know, your first couple of years, you're telling trainers they're probably not listening to you. Then all of a sudden they see your talent and you're winning. Now they're probably listening to you a lot more, right? Well, that, that's that's a, a prime example. It's like when I first started riding for Janine Sahadi, um, she just came out of the press box and was, you know, training horses. She went from being in the press box to being the leading trainer at Del Mar to winning – being the youngest woman ever to win a Breeders' Cup race. So Janine, she she was uh, amazing. She loved the horses. And, you know, she she had a faith in me like, like no other. She said, whatever you want to do, let's do it. You know, and, and um, you know, I, I was always, always up front like they were, if the horses were mine, you know, if the horses were my kids, if the horses were, you know, like I, w- I would baby them. I would like take care of them and say, you know what? When the horse is ready, I, I'll tell them. And and I think uh, Janine really fed off of that. Uh, Did you ever have anyone not appreciate that feedback? Did you ever have trainers feel like maybe you were trying to tell them how to do their job? No, I, I don't think. I really don't think that. You know, I, I've always, I've always been somebody that would talk to them. You know, I, I never, I was never like in a show like, get on, get off, thank you. You know, I, I never really did that. I mean, I, I was very vocal when I was younger and I would tell them, I'd come back and tell them, you know, the horse wasn't good enough. And, and, you know, I, I, I feel bad saying it now when I think about it, because you know what, I shouldn't have went about it that, 
that approach. If I if I would have went at the approach of, you know what, we weren't good enough today, let's get them next time, right? right. It would have been better for me. Sure. But I didn't do that. I would get off and say, you know, I was so uh, within the first six months of me riding, I was so mad when I got when I got beat on a horse and I I, I was like, you know, I was just too intense and I needed to I needed to change that, right? Wait, I thought that was the role they asked you to play on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was a fierce competitor. I would say. Well, oh, that, you know, horse racing is the only sport that you can lose 80 to 85% of the time and you're still very successful. Well, look at the baseball players. They're worse than we are. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, very true. I was... I was very fortunate. I, I when I played football, I was I played at a very high level. Baseball, I played at a very high level. Um, and there's not too many sports that I couldn't play. We have a uh, comment about that. I'm cutting you off here because they say I hear Corey is a great golfer. I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I pretty good. You know, I mean, at, at most sports, I mean, I've bowled 300 games. I've had hole in ones in golf. I've you know, I've shot 58 in golf. Um, wow. You know, I played football. We won championships playing football. And, you know, basketball, I can play basketball too. So it's just, you know, I just, God gave me a lot of skill and a lot of talent to be able to, to do these, all these other kinds of sports. So um, racing just came natural for me. So it was like, um, it was, it was almost like art to me because I, I, the way I, I looked at it was every race had a picture. And if you painted the picture and it came out somewhat the way you thought the race was going to pan out, you'd be in a spot to win. So that's the way I looked at it. So I always said, okay, I always figured who were the fast, who was the speed of the speed. And I figured who was the closer of the closer and tried to ride one of those two, or I would have to ride a horse that I, that I think I had to do something different to be able to, to win the race. See what I'm saying? So wow. that's the way I looked at it. Okay, I'm taking all this. You, because I, I say that I say this to a lot of guests. See if you notice this. I swear there's more wire to wire victories now than there was back when, say, you were right. Notice okay. that at all? I, 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 okay, so when I was first starting riding, I looked at the PPs of most horses, right? So I would look at, I mean, I knew every horse on the racetrack, and I would sit there and I would look at what's the percentage. What's the percentages of a first-time starter or a maiden, right? What is the percentage of them winning wire to wire? You know what Probably I mean? Not. Probably it, not. It, it, it's, it's like, I think it's up there like in the 75 to 80% wow. that the horse goes wire to wire. When wow. horses break their maiden, they usually run wire to wire, okay? Okay. Yeah. But when you're, when you're riding babies, unless you're teaching them how to run a certain way, like I would always teach a, a, a two-year-old to try to come off the pace like I did with Bolt the Oro and Gas Station Sushi and, you know, Sweet Cat of Mine, Serena Song, all these horses that I would work. I would always get them in, get them, break them, get them going strong and then get them in a rhythm. And then once I got them in that rhythm, I'd teach them to relax behind horses, you know, from shared belief to all of the horses that I rode. I always rode them with patience and let them take me to where I wanted them to go. That's how, I, that's how I rode horses. So I didn't force them to do it because I know if you're forcing something, it doesn't work. The right. horse is going to exert too much energy too fast and you're not going to have any horse. So wherever you're at and the, the rhythm that you have and the patience that you have and that you show and the ground you save is going to make you have more horse when you need to call on them. So that, that was basically in a nutshell how you ride a race. Well, I tell you what, I see why your son is such a successful agent, because I mean, this knowledge you're just speaking, I mean, wow, that you're, that has to give him a, a, a you know, a level up in his game. Um, yeah. Well, Matt, Matt, Matt does his homework too. You know, he's, he gets the, the sheets, he gets the numbers and, and I, I showed him how to, how I, how I learned how to do everything through the, when the, it was just the racing form. Now sure. you can get all the social media stuff and all that, but, um, I showed him how to do it through a racing forum and through the programs. How uh, you can, you know, pick the trainers, like what trainers are, you know, winning, who's got their horses. Like, like trainers go through, they call them slumps, but and they call them, you know, cycles because 
you're only going to have so many maidens. You're only going to have so many, you know, non-winners of one. You're only going to have so many yeah. non-winners of two. See what I'm saying? So who, who's going to have the majority of those, the, the maiden horses that you want to ride, okay? If you look at the trainer stats, right, you look at who has the majority of the babies. In the West Coast, it's Baffert. In the East Coast, it's Pel Fletcher. Or the grass horses go to uh, uh, Chad Brown, okay? So when you look at it, who's got the all-around outfit that you could ride for, right? In my eyes, it's Steve Asmussen. So those were the guys that I wanted to try to ride for, you know? The the Martin Cassie. He's got a lot of young horses, two-year-olds, so I would I created a, a you know, I had a rapport with, with Mark. So when you do these things and you, you do your homework and you're looking at the new guys coming up in trainers and, and outfits and owners and, and who you would like to ride for, you have to go out there as a rider and, and make that connection. Your agent can do so much, um, and you can only do so much. But at the end of the day, um, if you're if you ask enough, you're gonna get somewhere with asking and asking for help and say, look, you know what, I'm ready to you know fill in if your jock got hurt or something. You know, um, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. So just you know, be very humble, but at the same time, be forward, be strong, and and, and then the younger you are the more opportunities you're going to be able to get if you started at a young age to be able to ride and you can you can ride a little bit so great advice being, excellent being advice confident. i hope my husband's watching this show because that's great <laughs> you can give him a video of it. <laughs> yeah. if not he'll be watching the replay tonight when we get off <laughs> yeah, you go. Well, we have a comment well, here well, from Perry Hay. He says jockeys are the very best athletes and we very much so agree do you think just being all over physically you know you have to be extremely physically fit to to race ride um you say you're good in all other sports do you think it was that that helped you be good in all sports or vice versa the other sports made you a better jockey i think that i think god just gave me skills i just i i don't i couldn't say that one of the, any one of the other sports that i played made me a better jockey but uh, <laughs> i i i did wrestling i did football i did baseball i did golf i you know i play pool one-handed what well, i mean i don't know what else is there to play you know so at the end of the day you know god's got to give you the skill and the knowledge and and you got to give you the the path of making it happen so um he's got a plan for everybody and you just Absolutely. gotta seize it you gotta seize Absolutely. it Absolutely. So you brought up about having Mage in the Kentucky Derby. Does he wing the Preakness on Saturday? I like – is the horse that was second that Leatherby rode in there in the Preakness? Did no, no. Actually, no horses. So that would be another conversation. There are no horses besides Mage from the Kentucky Derby in the Preakness, and there's only seven – there's only eight total horses. Well, he's, he's the now horse. I mean, not, right. not, to, not to say that he can't get beat. I mean, I, I, the Preakness has always played for a speed by his track, the rail and speed. So, I mean, I, I, I hadn't got a chance to really go through the race and look at it, but um, if I had someone, I mean, I would, I would pick the Derby winner uh, over, uh, over the horses that are going to step up into that, to that level because you had to be so good to get into the Derby. So, Thank you. Corey, I'm doing it, Sean. I'm asking Corey the question. Sean yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask next. Sean That's and right. I were having a debate, literally a little a little healthy debate before you got on, okay, about the Derby and the Triple Crown. He was saying, I because I was saying, wow, eight-horse field. Like, that's not what you really want to see for the Preakness. You know, we thrive to see a full field. And he said, well, maybe they should space that out more. I said, you can't do that. I said, because then you're taken away from these horses that, 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 that did the impossible, you know? And he said, well, the times have changed, you know, and which I agree, you know, you got all these, these government things coming in and trying to tell people what they can and can't do. What is your opinion on that? I say, absolutely not. You cannot space out the time frame of the triple crown because it just, it, it may, it just takes away from the horses that did what so many can't do. What are your right. thoughts? Well, history is history, right? So, the Triple Crown was based on how hard it is to, just to get to the Derby, right? So you happen to win the Derby, and then you can only have one chance at winning it at three, right? So the whole thing with the Triple Crown is the history buffs, you cannot change the change the 
the time between each race. Okay, right. you can make like they make uh, they may change the criteria of getting in, like they did putting a point system in or a certain amount of money earned to get in. Um, in the very beginning, I don't think you can change the middle leg. I think that they, I think that if uh, if the horses in the Derby decide to skip the Preakness, um, I don't think that they should be able to run back in the triple in the other Triple Crown race. I think if you start in one Triple Crown race, you should have to start in all the Triple Crown races. I agree. To, you see what I'm saying? So I think that's they, a good thought. Yeah. The way that they could they could they could justify and fix it. To where more of the horses that are in because the are you looking, let me ask let me ask you there are you looking at it like the horses if you get somebody that didn't run in the triple in the first two legs goes in fresh and in the back against the two that have just ran in the two yeah okay correct so for that to happen okay I, I i don't agree with how they 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 do it i think if they made in a criteria where you would you would if you ran in the derby you can run back in the triple other triple crown races the the Preakness and the Belmont, right? But the only way you could do that is by having the point system that in the beginning, the horses that are in the Derby or the ones that are just out of the Derby picture, for example, say it's the, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th. So it would be the top 50 horses that would have that opportunity to run in those races, not just the horse that doesn't have the top 50 rankings to be able um, to run in there. See what I'm saying? So there has to be a ranking to the Triple Crown horses that can run in the Triple Crown races. So you I can't totally just get agree. a fresh horse that's coming from somewhere else to be able to do that. You see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah. So that you have to have the qualifications of the top 50 to be able to run in any of the Triple Crown races. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes it a lot more. And the I horses that. from the I Derby, the horses from the Derby have the right first right to get into the Preakness and the first right to get in the Belmont, but they can't skip the, the Preakness or the Belmont. You have to run in, you know, you have to run in all three. Otherwise, if you skip the, the Preakness, you can't run in the Belmont. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. it's what you're doing is you're stopping them from, you know, getting a fresher horse to try to beat the Derby horse, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. at the end of the day is what got, what got you to this point was, having to run in the preps, having to run in the other the races to be able to qualify for the Derby. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Absolutely. But when they did that, they should have put in this other criteria, which would be the top 50 horses get to run in the Triple Crown races. If you're not in the top 50, then it would go, say, yes. say none of the top 50 want to run in the Triple Crown races. Well, then it will go to the top 60. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have enough points and have to have enough uh, money earned from the the triple crown races leading up to the triple crown derby to the derby start to the preakness start great, to the Belmont start. that is a great thought process i love it I, I think it makes total sense because it is such a burnout when you're you know you're rooting on a just as a fan i mean just as a horse lover you're rooting on that triple crown winner and then here comes that fresh horse in on the belmont and you know might steal that and that takes us to a question grandma horse racing asks is that why so many horses lose the triple crown fresh horses no i don't think that's that's it at all i think i think that you go from running a mile and a quarter to shortening to a mile and three sixteenths to a mile and a half okay three different surfaces three different ovals i mean it, it's three different states it's it's that's the whole thing about the Triple Crown, why it makes it so hard, why it was so tough, okay? So and to compete at that level, you have to have a high cruising speed horse. you got to have tactical speed because speed dominates these type of races because is what happens is when your horse can get that high cruising speed and he can take the run out of the close. Uh-oh. thought that was me. Oh, there you go. Oh, there he is. There you are. <laughs> My phone's dying, darn it. Oh, no. Okay. Well, finish your, since finish that and we'll, we'll wrap it up here for you. So, so there's a high, you got to have a high cruising speed horse with tactical speed. So you can actually take that to the advantage of, of making the, the horses that are closing into you go faster into a closing pace. And then you're, it's going to make your horse at his advantage. If you slow it down to where the closers get close to you and they're going to kick you, they're going to kick you because you, your horse is a stayer. He's not gonna. He's not gonna separate himself 
from the 316th pole to the eighth pole wide enough for that closer to get to you. So that's what you'll see in these type of races. So you wow. really have to be a, a tactical horse with a high cruising speed, and you can't move into a fast pace if you are a closer. So that's where the closers get into a bad spot is when they close into a fast pace. So that's why the Derby in my era and the era of, you know, the 2000 eras where you see how fast the pace was and you see, you move into that fast pace, then you'll see anything happens in the race. But most likely it's going to be the horse that was like the stair, like the, the mid pack horse to the, to the horse that was stalking the, the horse that was on the lead. So that's where the difference of the derbies now to then, because I think the derby now is going to play in the favor of the horse that is speed and the horse that just is right there in the race, the way it's running now, the way right. the guys are riding. Right. All right. So one point for me, Sean, the derby the <laughs> down legs have to stay spaced out the same. Yeah. That was my thought too. I said, we, we well, can't do that. <laughs> well, my thing is every, and Corey, you know this, you, you said you do other sports. All other sports have changed as well. Now, some of them have gotten harder football. You instead of playing 10, 12 games, 16 games, now you're playing 17 games. So history kind of, changes throughout well it, it, it does change but it has to change for the better okay so changing of the changing of the the, the but th there's a triple crown in, in baseball you know where you, you have a you hit a base hit you get a double you get a triple you get a home run you hit for the cycle what are they going to change that facts you, you can't change certain things that are are so hard to obtain it takes it away from the greats that have already it accomplished takes away from the history and, and, it takes and away listen from the history of it. I totally well, understand I think, that. I'm, I'm just saying if you don't want an eight-horse field and say we get – if we got 12 of the 20 Kentucky Derby runners back in the Pimico, if we did it a month apart, how great would that be if okay, 12 so, of them ran all three? So that's what I'm trying to say. In order to get that to happen, right, if those guys, if the horses don't compete in the Derby and then they decide not to compete in the Preakness, they can't compete in the Belmont. That gives the next 20 horses an opportunity to run in the Preakness and to run in the Belmont. Well, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, let's not – why not – and I thought I saw this somewhere too. Why not let's make some kind of cash fund where if you compete in all three, you're eligible for that kind of bonus too, you know, to make it more incentivized well, to run all three. That's what they used to have, the $5 million bonus for Chrysler, right? right? Yeah. Yep. They had that. They yeah. did have that. Yeah, well, they so need to bring something back. <laughs> <laughs> bring back right? some of these old guys because, listen, I don't mean old in a bad way. I mean old old in the sport because you guys, I'm just, the, the times are changing, and I liked it better back then when I was a kid. <laughs> so so my, last, my last question for Corey then is, I, you know, I ask a question of a day. When I ask who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, 19 of my 20 answers were Corey Nakatani. Well, now you're in the Hall of Fame. So who's that answer now? Well, hold on a second. I got a little minor yeah. problem here, guys. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, shoot. I'm going to have to call you back. Oh, no. It's okay. Let's just wrap up, Corey. If you got something going on, it's all right. We we thank yeah. you so, so much. And right. uh, we, will, we will have you on again soon, okay? We appreciate you being here. All righty. Thank Thanks, you. Corey. I appreciate that. Sorry okay. That. It's okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Corey. Bye. All right. Well, if you just tuned in, he had an emergency there. Um, but he but was We kept him for 45 minutes anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> he was also. Uh-oh. Hold on. Okay. All right, sorry, I was having technical things on my end. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so great show. Wow, man, I could sit and talk to him all day. Um, great advice. I hope there were some young riders that were watching and or young horsemen, you know, looking to get in the sport because he gave some good knowledge there. And um, I'm a total fan. I, I'm I'm I feel privileged and honored that I got to, you know, talk to him tonight. We didn't get to talk too too much about the Hall of Fame, but um, I mean, I think that just speaks for itself uh it's the whole thing so <laughs> yeah and he was very unselfish about you know it's the family thing and stuff yeah. like that and you know that was cool to hear too is he really you know as you get older you know you know he when he was younger he was known a little bit more as the talker a little bit of that kind of stuff but he recognizes hey that's maybe where i could have got a little bit better and could have done it different if i would to tell a young jockey maybe not do it that way but uh, right 
Right. Hey, it all worked out. It all worked out in the end for him, definitely. It, it did, and, and he also <laughs> gave us a little insight on that reputation as to why he was that way. He said, you know, it was a uh, very, very much you can't do it. People were telling him, so he kind of got that chip on his shoulder, like, "Well, watch me." So, um, very cool story. I mean, I, I know that was only a tip of his iceberg. I'm sure that we got, but uh, I, I just feel honored that we got to have him on tonight. So, awesome, awesome show. Um, what else do we got coming up, Sean? So we'll have FanDuel TV's Dubs Anderson. Um, he's relatively new. I'd say a little less than a year on FanDuel TV. I get to do the socials for TVG, and um, you'll, you'll fall in love with him tomorrow, too. Just always smiling, always happy, loves the sport. Um, it's hitting a lot of tickets he gives out to the public. So um, nice. we'll, all, we'll all like him tomorrow. And then uh, Wednesday, uh, up-and-coming jockey. Uh, she's had a heck of a start for Horseshoe Indianapolis, McKenna Anderson will be on very cool very cool yeah she's been riding for i think two years but the start of this meet she's really been winning she just won the other day on a 46 to 1 wire to wire uh, she's been putting some incredible rides so we'll get to meet her wednesday i love it and you know speaking of tvg guys i had to ask um i, I did you see my thing on twitter andre went won a race last week and the owner is friends with todd from tvg and todd had, yeah and had a stick man of Todd in the winter circle <laughs> and Andre came home that night and was like, babe, did you see the stick man in my, in my, in the winter circle? And I didn't see it live because I was, I guess, so focused on the horse. And I was like, what? And I went back and I looked and I posted it on Twitter and I tagged Todd because yep, he is there in my husband's winter circle. <laughs> on the stick man. So did he share hilarious. it? Uh, I think, yeah, he did. He did. He shared yeah, okay. it. Did. So Todd Trump and I, it's funny because we had him on the player's edge um, and then when this job came up with TBG, um, I went through Todd to help me get it. And Todd, you know, I owe everything to Todd for having the job with TBG. And he'll be at Pimlico this weekend, and I'll get to meet him because I will be there with TBG Social. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. So much fun. Okay, well, awesome. We'll be back tomorrow. Um, and again, Wednesday night, I'm here with you guys all week. And then what's going on tomorrow with the guys? Um, tomorrow's Tuesday, so it'll be parks. It should be uh, Terry and Rich probably around 12.30 p.m. Eastern, um, and they'll do parks part two. They did parks today, so uh, always giving out good picks and information on there. You know, Rich does the whole uh, computer thing. and can tell you who's going to be on the lead, that kind of stuff, so there you go. Rich, Rich and, and Terry both had the pick four today. So. Yeah, they and didn't they? I saw like a really big hit. Last week, right? Somebody was watching their show and got like a really big ticket. Didn't I see that get posted? Well, yeah. Well, the best best thing with any pick show is I don't just follow like don't just follow Richard Terry's. Oh, Julie, gone. Um, but combine them with yours too. If you know, you just may hear what Terry or Rich has to say, and you really like that horse. Throw them in with yours and um, combine them, and then you'll be able to win. I don't know where Julie went, but she'll be back. I'm back. So that's I'm that's back. the best way to do it. Same way as like Dobbs Anderson when he gives out picks too. Don't necessarily toss your horses, but if you see somebody that Dobbs Anderson threw in, Rich threw in, Terry threw in, Charles threw in, whoever, then you might want to add that to your ticket because that could be the difference. How many times do we get three out of four? Well, you may be able to combine them, and that's how you you hit some some of these big tickets. I love it. I'm touching too much stuff on my computer. That's I did that to myself. I like I don't even know what's happening. All right, guys, it is nine o'clock and it's my bedtime so i will see you guys tomorrow i think that takes us all wire to wire and we will see everybody in the winter circle slowly <laughs> we're on a closer okay yes we're there in the winter circle <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>